Um, so the, let's look at speaking test. Um, the speaking test is the aspect, aspect of the IELTS test that assesses your ability to prove that you can communicate. In the aspect of the IELTS test that evaluates your ability to converse. So they want to be sure that you can speak English. Now, um, speaking test lasts for 10 to 15 minutes only. Only 10 to 15 minutes you are done. Now, during the speaking test, you would have to converse with an examiner. So you are, you are going to be having the speaking test session one-on-one -on -one with an examiner. So it could be virtually arranged or physically done. So if it is the virtual arrangement, then you're going to be speaking to someone who is live on a screen. The person will be asking you a couple of questions. Then if the physical one, you meet someone seated and waiting for you. Now, during the speaking test, two things you are meant to go with. One, your international passport. Then two, your writing uh, material, just pen or pencil only. International passport and your pen or pencil. These are the only two things you are to go with. When you go for your speaking test, one biggest thing you are supposed to achieve before going and when you arrive at the speaking test when you is confidence. Please do not trade your confidence for anything. With your confidence intact, you will do wonderfully in your speaking test. All right. Why are we being tested on our ability to communicate? This is because we are considered to be non-native English speakers. We are non-native English speakers. That's why we are being put to test. Secondly, we ought to have received waiver to go for speaking tests, especially for a country such as Nigeria, where English is the lingua franca. That's the official language. Not just being a lingua franca, also our English is being given to us by the British, since Nigeria is a British colonized nation. But the truth is, Nigerians or majority of Nigerians do not speak the English that the British brought to their country. You now have your own type of English. And your English is an interpretation of your native dialect. You tend to translate your native dialect into English. That's what you speak. And that does not sound English. So because of the discrepancies, because of the bad communication, I have decided to actually put everyone to test to confirm your exposure and ability to communicate effectively. Now, when you come to a country such as Nigeria, it's considered to be a multi-ethnic and lingual country. And there are lots of different factors that affect our spoken English. For instance, if you go to the southeast, that's the Igbo, you will notice that some Igbo speakers have this mother tongue interference, mother tongue factor, such as the, the L and the R. Where someone will tell you, my name is Irinda, I ran the Irigo from Rondon. Mm -hmm. You know, the R and L factor. 
So they are scared, they need to be sure that they can manage it. Because if you go to their country and take up the job of a nanny or a domestic staff, then you may be surprised that one month or two months after assuming that um, job, they are a baby of a British person might say hello daddy hello, hello. <laughs> because the nanny <laughs> says hello. hello so the child may mix and assume that that's the right pronunciation so when you go to the west you see people saying my art is hurting me i went to church and people were shouting that's their own factor sh factor ch factor they remove h when there is no where there is h bring h when there is no h it is their factor. When you go to the north, you hear them saying, Kai, my brother from the north is coming. So all these factors make the IELTS to say, okay, we just want to be sure, please. We don't want you to go to a country and start influencing our people with your English problem. So these are some of the reasons and so many others. In Africa, generally, you will agree with me that there is this culture that is being imposed on its citizens that you are not meant to look directly in the eyes of an elderly person when you are speaking to the person. Mm. Looking at that person is considered to be disrespectful, right? Yes. Now, in IELTS, mm. the culture is opposite. You must look at the eyes of the person that you are talking to. So, Nigerians have this challenge. Because we already have that nurturing. So it has become a part of us. When we are speaking to you, we look away. Mm. But to the white, looking away means you are telling lies or you are nervous. You, you are not, not confident. Straightforward. So all of these factors put together mm. made them to say, all right, so come on, we have to test everyone. Let's be sure who we are Employed. bringing to our country. Now, there are things we call speaking rules in IELTS test. So let's get these rules that you need to understand in or during your speaking test. Mr. Shegu, can you hear me? Good morning. Okay. Now let's let's look at the rules of speaking test. Rule number one. Never give a short answer. Never give a short answer. That's rule number one. Rule number two. Keep speaking until the examiner asks you another question. Keep speaking or keep talking until the examiner asks you another question. Number three, never form an accent while speaking. Never form an accent, do not. Never form an accent while speaking. Accent, A-C-C-E-N-T. A-C-C-E-N-T, accent. Never form an accent while speaking. Rule number four, always keep eye contact with the examiner while speaking. Always keep or maintain eye contact with the examiner. Always keep or maintain eye contact with the examiner while speaking.
sure to speak audibly. Ensure to speak audibly. I can hear you. Okay, you mean when you were able to achieve all other factors very well, but due to upbringing, you are not comfortable looking at the examiner in the eyes while speaking. Whether it's going to affect what you are supposed to, whether it's going to affect your performance, right? Okay, um, it won't affect your performance absolutely. Right, but it's it's going to have an impact in their judgment or evaluation towards you because part of your proof or show of confidence is you keeping eye contact. It it shows that you are confident. It also shows that you are saying the truth. It also means you you mean what you are saying. That's when you keep eye contact. But you need to understand that the rule does not compel you to station or fix your eyes at the examiner without looking away. No. That's not what it means. You can look rightward, look leftward, but do not look downward. Looking downward is negative. Do you understand this? All right, so just, you would learn how to manage your eye contact when speaking to the examiner. Okay, so let's proceed. Next rule, that's rule number six, right? Do not rush to speak or respond to a question you have not clearly understood. Do not rush to begin to speak or respond to a question that you have not clearly understood. That's rule number six during your speaking test. Do not rush to speak or respond to a question that you have not clearly understood. Rule number seven. Rule number seven is feel free to request a rephrasal of a question that's unclear to you. Feel free to request a rephrasal or a repeat of a question that's unclear to you. Feel free to request a rephrasal or a repeat of a question that's unclear to you. Rule number eight. Apply voice modulation while speaking if you can. Apply voice modulation while speaking if you can. Apply voice modulation while speaking if you can. Next rule, that's rule number nine. Feel free to apply natural fillers while speaking, but do not overuse it. Feel free to apply natural fillers while speaking, but do not overuse it. Natural fillers. Yes, examples of natural fillers would be? Fillers. Yes, natural fillers. Feel free to apply natural fillers. Why? While speaking, but do not overuse it. 
On the board, we have examples of natural pillars. That's when you are trying to remember what to say or trying to remember the right words to use. You are like, um, or, um, right? Feel free to use those natural pillars while speaking, but do not overuse them. Rule number 10. Number 12, the use of contractions while speaking is a proof of professionalism and high in-depth command of the language. The use of contractions is a proof of professionalism and high index of the command of English. The use of contraction while speaking is a proof of professionalism and high index of command of the language. So always use contractions. It's a proof of professionalism and high index command of the language. Therefore, Use it while speaking. So these are important rules in speaking text. But most importantly, don't sell or trade your confidence for anything. Confidence alone will help you to achieve anything you want to achieve during your speaking text. Confidence alone will help you to actually understand questions. Confidence will help you to articulate your points. Confidence will help you to ask for a repeat or represent of questions that are there to you. Confidence will help you to speak without stuttering, right? Without stammering. So don't trade with your confidence for anything. All right, so we actually say when you go for speaking tests, some persons are introverts. So they hardly socialize or open up to people that they are not familiar with. They are always in their shell. But for IELTS, you need to keep your shell at home. You need to keep your introvert nature at home. When you go for speaking tests, you have to be very open and jovial. So that would help you to communicate and speak fluently. So let's look at how this speaking test runs. When you go for speaking test, you will realize that it's going to be just you and the examiner, no other person. The examiner would welcome you and offer you a seat. It is natural to say thank you, then you sit. You grab the seat. When you sit, it is important that you sit confidently. Do not sit one-sided because it will prove you lack confidence. 
sit 90 degrees and look at the examiner. Now the examiner will give you a preamble of the speaking test and then introduce him or herself to you and after that the part one will begin. So for part one, the examiner will ask you what's your name? So when an examiner asks you what your name is, please there are four templates with which you may you can respond to the question, what's your name? My name is, or what's your name? My name's, or what's your name? I am, or what's your name? I am. These are four different templates. That's a wrong English. My name's is. My name's R is a wrong English. Ah. So people who say my name's R, this is what they try to say. Mm -hmm. But they do not know the origin. Mm -hmm. It simply means my name is, but in a contracted way. Remember one of the rules says contraction is a high. So you can either say, and when you're saying your name, please, when you're giving the examiner your name, if your name is not an English name, you really need to say your name slowly and break your name according to the acquisition. Right? Don't rush to say your name. Examiners need to understand your name or get your get to hear your name properly, not really understand it. The examiner needs to hear your name properly and also your conversation, your speaking session will, will be recorded. So saying your name slowly would enable the recording to capture what you say. Mm -hmm. And remember, one of the rules says speak audibly. So you need to speak up so that the recording will capture your response questions. So what's your name? You can simply say, my name is Benedict Eke. Or what's your name? My name's my name's Benedict Eke. Okay. My name is my name is Okay, it's still the same. It's the same as my name is. is. My name is Benedict Eke. Why should I break my teeth when all that was happening? You choose which is <laughs> more comfortable and comfortable. So you can say my name is Benedict mm -hmm. Eke. Yes. Or you can say I, I am, am Benedict Eke. Yes. Or you say I am Benedict Eke. My, my name is I am Benedict Eke. So you choose the uh, manner you would like to introduce yourself to the examiner, right? Remember, do not rush your name if it's not an English name. So once you introduce your name to the examiner, the examiner wants to know what to call you. So the examiner would ask you, what can I call you? When an examiner asks you, what can I call you? You can then begin to give more detailed information. The question, what's your name, is the only platform or area that you give short answer because there is a particular way to express yourself. But any other question that comes afterwards, please give detailed information. Do not give short answer. So what can I call you? You can simply say, well, you can call me by my English name, Victor, or Julian. You can call me by my English name, Victor. Oh, you can call my English name, Julian. Examiner may also ask, what can I call you? You can simply say, well, I'm, popular, I'm popularly called um, Benedict by my friends and family. But for the purpose of this exam and for, and for ease of pronunciation, you can call me Ben. I'm popularly called Benedict by my friends and family. I'm popularly called I'm from responding to you. I'm popularly called Benedict by my friends and family. But for the purpose of this exam and for ease of pronunciation, you can call me Ben. Now at this point. The examiner has gotten exactly what to call you. So, I prefer to be called Ben 
for ease of pronunciation and particularly for the purpose of this examination. But you can choose to say, you can call me by my native name. Then you say your native name. Then remember to say it slowly. But, the purpose, but for the purpose of this exam. And for ease of pronunciation. Mm -hmm. All right? So after saying what the examiner mm -hmm. can call you. Ease of pronunciation. After giving the examiner what he or she can call you, you simply would be asked to present your means of identification. So the examiner would ask you, all right, then, may I please take a look at your means of identification? So when the examiner requests to see your means of ID, you simply need to provide your international passport and show to the examiner. Okay, if it is a virtual, mm -hmm. your passport will be scanned and sent to the examiner. Mm -hmm. If it is a physical, it will be with you. You have to present it to the examiner. Now the question is, how do you present your international passport for means of identification to the examiner? So you simply say, if the examiner says, all right, Ben, may I please take a look at your means of identification? Okay. You simply say, oh, sure. Here you go. So as you're giving the passport to the examiner, you're also saying something. Don't just stretch your hands and give the passport without saying a thing. It's not a sign language test, it is a speaking test. So you need to speak at each point. Okay, Ben, may I please take a look at your means of identification? Oh, sure, here it is. Or, yes, of course, this is my means of identification. Or, certainly, you can have a look at my means of identification. You need to speak something and let what you're saying synchronize with the action of giving. So once the examiner has taken a look at your passport and confirms that the photo on it is actually you, and the examiner also looks at the names on the passport and confirms or compares them to what you said earlier, the examiner is okay with it. And the examiner will pass it back to you and then the speaking test will continue. Right? So after that, the examiner would ask you, okay, so Ben, tell me, where are you from? Where are you from? So at this point, you want to make, you want to talk about the name of your community. You want to talk about the local government area. You want to talk about the state. You want to talk about the geographical location. And then lastly, you want to talk about your country. When the examiner asks you, so tell me, Ben, where are you from? These are things you may want to look at. That if your current location or your place of origin has all of these. There are some nationalities, there are some persons from different countries that don't have local government. Maybe don't have community, I don't know. So it depends. Some people don't have geographical locations. I don't know, so it depends. So Ben, if you have all of these, if the examiner requests to know your place of origin, simply establish that, uh, well, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I am an ADG of a popular community called, you give the name of your community, in, you give the name of the local government thank area. You. Say thank you for this opportunity. Yes, if you wish. It's not compulsory. Oh, thank you for this privilege to express your, uh, my place of origin. Well, uh, it would inter inter interest you to note that I hail from a small town called maybe um, Ife. Thank you for this privilege to share my place of origin with you. Well, I am an indigenous or a native of a small town called Ife. 
in Ife East Local Government Area of Osho State, located at the southwestern part of Nigeria. So you are establishing your place of origin following these information. One, mention the name of your community. For instance, I hail from a popular town called Oposi in Oposi East local government area of Anambra State, located at the southeastern part of Nigeria. Or I hail from a small town called Oweri in Oweri North local government area of Imo State, which is located at the southeastern part of Nigeria. Or I'm an indigent of I'm an indigent of Bako. I'm an indigent of Bako in Omadigo local government area of Benue State, located at the north central region of Nigeria. So you just need to establish this information when you are asked to talk about your place of origin. Okay, so after talking about where you are from, the examiner would want you to talk about your community. Please tell me a little, a little bit about your community. So to talk about your community, establish your place of origin, that's the name of your community. Give the name of your community. Give an estimated population of the people of your community. Talk about the predominant occupation. of the people of your community. Talk about the general description of the people of your community. Industrious, accommodating, hospitable, religious. And many more. Talk about your native delicacies of delicacy. Talk about your festival and other information. Okay, so to give information about your place of origin, you need to establish the name of the place. You need to talk about an estimated population of the people of your community. You need to establish the predominant occupation. You need to talk about the general description of, your, of the people of your community, that is, if they are industrious or they are lazy, if they are accommodating, if they are, accommodating, if they are hospitable, if they are religious, or whatsoever I want to say about them. Talk about 
the, your, your native delicacies, your local festivals, and the likes. So these are information you really need to put together when you are giving the info about your community. So I think if you don't know some of these things, find a way to um, get the information from your people. So after establishing this information, the examiner might want to ask or would ask to know what you do. So the examiner can ask you. So tell me, Ben, what do you do? What do you do? So at this point, the examiner is asking to know your job description. Pardon me, to know your employment status. What do you do? The examiner is asking to know your employment status. So at this point, you want to establish or expose or tell the examiner whether you are gainfully employed or you are an entrepreneur or you are a student. So you need to fix, know where you belong, and tell the examiner what you do. So let me just run a little model of how um, it can be expressed. What do you do, Ben? Oh, um, I was actually expecting this question. Um, well, I, um, I would say I am gainfully employed, um, especially having studied medicine in the university for six years and came out with a good grade. I've actually worked with a, you know, a couple of health facilities, uh, but at the moment I'm gainfully employed by the federal government on the National Hospital Abuja. So what do you do? Of course, you are gainfully employed. What if you are a business owner? What do you do? Oh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I am a business owner. And um, this was uh, vetted by my, uh, my flair and passion to own and run my own business and have control of my finances. So upon graduation from the university where I studied XYZ, I decided to raise capital to set up a business of my own. This is how to establish that you are an entrepreneur. So um, once you establish that you are either a student or um, you are either a student or you are gainfully employed, then the examiner would ask you, so tell me, Ben, what job do you do? The first question was, what do you do? Now, after ex establishing that you are either gainfully employed, either at the private sector or government uh, organization, then it's, or you are an entrepreneur or you are a student, the examiner want to know the job you do. So the examiner will ask you, what job do you do? So this question is asking to know about your job description, the role you play. So what job do you do? Uh, well, as a licensed, uh, certified and practicing medical doctor, I track my patients, I diagnose them of ailments, I make drug prescriptions, I um, refer them for specialist facilities if need be. I also uh, follow up to make sure they are responding positively to treatments. These are your roles as a medical doctor. If you are an entrepreneur, what job do you do? You want to establish the fact that um, being the CEO of your organization, you ensure that all the supplies or importations are done and they are cleared and taken or made available at your 
physical shop or office, and then you you dispatch or have them delivered to your clients, or you make them available for people to actually purchase or have access to. So you talk about, you take stock, you um, do all the banking or financial transactions, you do all the networking, whatever it is that you do to make your business thrive. So establish all of that. Those are your job descriptions as an entrepreneur. So the next examiner would ask you, why did you go for that line of business? Why did you choose to go for that line of business? Now, several reasons, my several factors might lead to your choice of delving into that area of professionalism. One, it may be because of family wish. It's your drive. Yes. That may be because of family wish. Some families actually aspire to have a medical doctor in their family. Some families hope to have a military or uniform, a personnel. Some families want to have a lawyer. Some families want to have a religious, um, a clergy, maybe a reverend priest or a pastor or whoever it is. Some people want to have a musician in their family. Some want to have um, a, a footballer. So it, it could be because of family which, and then it fell on your shoulders. It could also be because you have a role model that you always look up to. So you wish to actually be like that person or outrun or outshine the person. Some persons are sojourns today because of Ben Carson. So they really want to be successful in a career and just as he has achieved. Some persons have decided to go into an area of specialism or professionalism because of the financial benefits, estacles or remunerations. Right? So you really need to identify what it is that made you to go for that area of specialism or professionalism. It could also be as a result of passion. So find out what it is. Then after that, examiner would ask you questions on societal issues. Questions on societal issues might be, do you enjoy eating chocolate? While, or did you enjoy eating chocolate while growing up as a child? Examiner might ask you that. So you need to read. Respond. Don't always say no outrightly. Remember, you are expected to speak. So saying no, I didn't, is not actually enough. So did you enjoy eating chocolate while growing up as a child? If you did, express yes and give how you actually consumed or enjoyed eating chocolates. If it's a no for you, simply establish that, well, I would say no because um, um, I actually am from I actually am from uh, an average family, so we don't have so much money to be buying junks such as chocolates. So we prioritized our spending on food that will sustain us more, right? But I always. Um, saw children eating chocolate. The truth is I, I admired to be like them, but um, unfortunately I was not opportunity. to. You see, I've expressed no, but I didn't come out bluntly to say that. What was your favorite pet? So you won't answer no before no. asking this? I actually said no. Okay. But I gave my reasons to establish the no. While growing up as a child, please tell me what was your favorite pet. So you want to talk about your favorite pet. If you never had a pet, build a pet. Build a pet. Anything can be a pet to you. Right? So you need to create a pet. It could be a doll that you usually carry. 
you know, it could be a particular item that was so dear to you, you know, so you want to establish that that was your pet and it made you feel um, some form of company whenever that pet is with you. You may also be asked, tell me about a special item or gift or belonging that you would not trade for anything. Talk about a special item or belonging that you will not trade for anything. So you need to create a particular item that you had or you still have actually. So talk about how precious it is to you. Establish how you feel having that thing. Maybe who gave it to you if it was a gift or you bought it. How you cherish it. How you will never give it out for anything. Do you understand? So establish that. You may also be asked what type of family exists in your community. There are two types of families. We have special item you have. Yes. So you. No, not pets. I'm done with pet long ago. So you need to talk about what the pet is, how you cherish the pet, um, how you feel having the pet around you. So you need to describe what that pet looks like, the color of the pet, how you got it or who gave it to you, and how you feel having that pet around you. So that's about the pet description. Then I also talk, talked about a special item that you have. An item that you a gift or item no, that you have. Preference. Yes, that's what we're talking about. No, 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 no. No, that's it. Okay. okay. So, so personal. An item you own or have or had that you cherished so much. So you really want to talk about that? Who gave it to you? what that thing is, how long it has been with you, how you feel having that thing, right? So those are things you want to look at. Now I was talking about types of families that exist in your community. So you want to establish, for instance, you have two types of families, you have the nuclear family and you have the extended families. Don't stop at that. Go for that to define what each of the two types of families really represent. Where does one, that one come now? Still on society with this. Okay. So, nuclear family entails a family that is made up of mother, father, and their immediate children only. Whereas, the extended family comprises the nuclear family and their extended relations, which includes both grandparents, right? So these are ways to respond to questions of societal issues. Examiner might also ask you to talk about a book you read recently. Please describe the book or tell me a little bit about the book you read recently. So to talk about the book you read recently, even if you're not the reading type, you need to convert something to book. It might be a movie that you watched, convert it to a book. All right? So give it a number of pages. Give it a, an author. Give a name of the writer. Whether it is fictional, give the name. Give it a title. Give the book a title. Talk about the moral lessons of that book. So these are things you want to consider when you are talking about a book you read recently. Examiner might also ask you to describe your current accommodation. 
So to describe your current accommodation, you do not need to go by way of describing the direction to your house. No, don't do that. You can simply start by saying, well, I live on an estate in a, a three bedroom apartment. It's quite spacious and well ventilated. I enjoy the setting of the, of the accommodation. Um, the, the walls, the paintings on the walls are quite attractive and appealing to me. Um, it's quite serene, okay? Um, it gives me comfort and privacy as well. And of course, my current accommodation is secure. So these are things we want to talk about concerning your current accommodation. You might also be asked to talk about how you spend your weekends. How do you spend your weekends? So you need to establish when weekends begin in your country. There are countries that weekends begin on Thursday and ends on maybe Sunday. Some persons, their weekend begins on Friday and ends on Sundays. Some Friday to Saturday. Some people Saturday to Sunday. It depends. So you need to establish when your weekend begins in your country. So how do you spend your weekends? Well, um, this is something I'll, I'll be looking forward to sharing. Um, weekends in my country begins on Saturdays, on Fridays and end on Saturdays. As a matter of fact, we have a particular slogan that we say on Fridays, TGIF, which means Thank God Eats Friday. It's a moment or it is a period when we tend to have some more time to ourselves, to bond, to have some time out with our friends, to hang out, to party, to do some chores, to do general cleanup in the house, to prepare for the next week, to attend certain functions. So for me, on Friday, I close earlier, I close early from work, unlike other days, and I get home, have a little time to rest. Then um, I also attend a little outing with my friends, sometimes to the club, sometimes to other um, functions. Then I, of course, get to sleep late, since I know I wouldn't have to wake up early the next day to go to work. Of course, it's going to be a Sunday. On Saturday proper, I do a lot of cleaning up, house chores, top-ups top of um, food items by going, to shop, by going shopping, getting some food items, cooking and preparing and packaging food and storing in the fridge for the week, um, taking care of myself, like going for a spa, a massage, going for some manicure, pedicure, and the likes. If you're a male, you do some hair course. Um, you also do some laundries. And prepare for the week. Have ample time to rest. If you also need to attend functions such as birthday party, housewarming, um, wedding ceremonies, and so many other functions, you do all of that mostly on weekends. All right? Then, examiner might also ask you to describe your daily routine. How do you perform your daily routine? So you want to talk about waking up in the morning, saying a little prayer, saying a little prayer, uh, preparing for work, um, getting yourself ready if you have, if you're a family person, you talk about the family preparing and getting the entire family ready both for school and to work. So you talk about going to work or dropping the children off at school, then proceeding to work, getting to the office, doing all the tasks you have on your table and other errands you need to run, then having your break, lunch break for instance, resuming back to work, closing for the day, and returning back home and winding up for the day. 
This is how to describe your daily routine. So it has to begin from morning and end at night or evening when you retire to bed. Then you end it by saying, this is how my week, my routine goes from Monday to maybe Friday. Since my, my Saturdays vary because of different programs and activities. Examiner might also ask you to describe or say why or how people spend time with their family in your country. How do people spend time with their families in your country? How? So people spend time with their families by way of having dinner together, sitting out around the house at night to tell moonlight stories or tales, praying together, attending certain social gatherings together such as comedy shows, concerts, weddings, going to the cinema to see movies. Some affluent families in my country spend time with their families by organizing picnics, rendezvous, traveling to different places, sometimes even outside the country on vacations. These are different ways people spend, spend time with their families in my country. You may also be asked to talk about your preference between the analog or the archaic lifestyle or the current way of living. Be asked to look to express your preference between the old lifestyle and the current ways of living. So you want to talk about whether you prefer the old life people lead, the ways they live their lives then, whether you prefer it to the current way of living, or you prefer the current to the former. You may be asked to establish your preference whether you will go for the old lifestyle or you want to or you prefer the current way of living. Right? You might as well be asked to express your thoughts on the current trend of fashion as compared to the ancient style of dressing. So you need to establish your choice of preference. Okay? Also, you might be asked to establish the favorite part of your house to you. What or where or which is the favorite part of your house to you? So you want to talk about whether it is your bedroom, your sitting room, your dining room, your study, your toilet, your kitchen, where? You need to talk about it. When you make a choose, please ensure and endeavor to give your reasons why that particular part of your house is your favorite. So let's look at personal preferences. Examiner might ask you, please tell me about your dream car. Your dream car. So you need to establish your dream car. And to talk about your dream car, First, the name of the product, for instance, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, um, Peugeot, Renault, Honda, Hyundai, uh, Chevrolet, which one? You need to establish your, your dream car. Then, what model of the car are you looking at? 
So talk about the name, the product, the model. Then you describe why it is your dream car. In your description, factor in color, factor in the shape of the vehicle, factor in the speed and balance on, on the road when it's moving, factor in the interior and other sassy features that it has. Now you may be asked to talk about your favorite color, your favorite color. When you want to talk about your color, your favorite color, don't go for a color that will not leave you with options to speak for a moment. Do not go for a color that has nothing much to talk about, like pink. What do you want to say about him? It's a feminine color. After that, what else? Not. So make sure you go for a color that would give you more talking time. You might want to talk about blue. You might want to talk about white. You might want to talk about black. You might want to look at red. They have so much to talk about. So that's when you are giving your reasons. That color is your favorite color. Then examiner might ask you, is it possible for color to affect a person's mood? Do you think color, a color can affect, or do you think color can affect a person's mood? Is that possible? Color can affect a person's mood. Yes, it can. There are, there are dresses you put on, the color alone makes you feel proud. It gives you some level of confidence. It, it raises your esteem a little high. There are colors you wear according to some mindsets. They say color can affect your mood by way of weather. Some people say black. Black dresses attract heat. I don't know how to do that piece. But that's, that's some kind of... Um, Believe. Also, when you see a group of people wearing black or blue, it passes a message to us, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe they are bereaved, right? They are mourning someone. They are burying the dead. When you see people wearing red, 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 all through, you might want to run away, right? Because it might pass some form of danger or fright to you. So, of course, Colors can affect a person's mood. Now, you may also be asked, how do people carry out their shopping in your country? How do people carry out shopping in your country? Of course, when it's when you are when you're undergoing or when you're faced with your speaking test, please note that examiner wants to hear you speak about things in the past, present, and project into the future. They want to hear you make use of past tenses, present tenses, and future tenses. So talking about how people carry, carry out shopping in your country, please retrospect to the past practice. So talk about how it was done in the past, where people usually go to a particular market that is um, being attended or frequented by, that uh, people frequent on a particular day, right? They go to the market square, everyone, you either go there with your item to sell, or you go there to buy. So people attend such markets on a particular or specific day. So you go with, your, with a list of what you want, you walk around to look for shops or, look, or spots that have the particular thing you want to buy. When you find it, you engage the person by haggling price with the person. You will haggle by haggling price with the person. When you get to an agreement that is profitable for the both parties, then transaction will, will be um, 
will we, we take place. Hago, Hago, H A G G L E, H A G G L E, Hago. That's to again negotiate that way for you. Hago. So when you reach an agreement, the payment will be made and the item will be given. That's for the past. But in the present, shopping is done in three ways. Shopping can be okay, we could say in two ways. It can be done physically and it can be done virtually. Under the physical approach, people can shop at two different locations depending on your class or preference. Presently, shopping is done in two different ways. Yes, physically or virtually. So under the physical approach, there are two categories that people may choose to do their shopping, depending on your financial strength or preference. So there is still the local practice where you go to the open market with a list of all you want. Then you have the prices with the sellers if, you are, if there's an agreement, then you make your purchases. The second option is going to an enclosed shopping mall or supermarket with a list of what you want. But the disadvantage is you don't have the avenue to have a price because every item has got its own price tag. So you are free to pick as much as the items you find to be affordable to you, put in your cart or basket, go to the cashier who sums up all you have taken and you make the payment. Payment or cash. But the traditional approach, presently, payments can be made by cash or by transfer. Although some sellers now have their point of sale gadget called POS. Alright, so these are different templates, different ways that shopping can be done physically. On the virtual templates, you do not need to have a physical contact with the seller. All you need to do is have a smartphone that has internet access. Log on to the uh, virtual mall, virtual shopping mall, sort through the different sections, select all you need, then check out, make payments. Payments on the virtual platform can be true, card payments, bank transfer, or payment upon delivery. Now, an examiner may ask you, <clears throat> is it possible to show in your country without having to pay? I would like to hear from us. Is it possible to shop in your country without having to pay? Um, Mr. Shego, is it possible to shop in your country without having to pay? Without having to pay at all, is it possible? It's not possible? All right, so you must pay. Mrs. Charles, is it possible to shop in your country without having to pay? No. Chief, is it possible to shop in your country without having to pay? I don't to pay at all. You, you are not to pay at all. At all. It's not yes. possible. It's not possible. It's not. Now, when you say no to the examiner, the examiner can ask you, all right, so tell me, have you heard about window shopping? Yes. How do you pay in your country when you window shop? You don't buy. I'm not talking about buying, I say shopping. Shopping. Mm. When you win the shop, how do you pay? 
when you were in the shop, you just step by the shop, mm -hmm. you know, move around, mm -hmm. try to see one or two things that yeah, you might be interested in buying mm -hmm. at a later time. Mm -hmm. You could move around and you go. You leave. You have shops. You need no shop. You don't have. Okay, that is only that is that is the only window, window shopping because so, you have shopped, but yes, yes, you did, did not did pick did. anything. Is a sense. So there is a way to shop in your country without having to pay. Yes, that's that's through a practice called window, window shopping. shopping. So not say no. Yes. You know, when you say no, examiner will ask you, how do people pay when they window shop up in your country? And like, oh, oh, oh. Sorry, please. I need more light on virtual buying virtual markets. Virtual shopping. Mm -hmm. You just have to, you need to have, you need to have Smart. a smartphone connected to internet. You log on to the online shopping mall. You surf through the different sections, pick the things you want, check out, and then Payments under this category can be via card payment, bank transfer, um, or payment upon delivery. Right? So these are ways your part one can go. Right? Again, a Q card. These are ways your part one would go.